Any thoughts about walking in particular and its relationship with weight, weight loss? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the story with weight uh, and weight loss and activity is, is an extremely complicated one. Um, and uh, I think the data on this are becoming very much clearer. And the, the first thing to say is that the saying to people who want to lose weight, eat less and exercise more, is a recipe for disaster. It does not work. Uh, it's not possible to tell people to eat less and exercise more uh, and expect that they will lose weight and keep it off. Why? Because uh, your metabolism changes. The rate at which you burn energy changes depending on how much you are eating. Uh, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is our bodies are designed to cap the rate at which we burn energy when we're exercising. And you can demonstrate this very, very easily. So if you put somebody lying back on a couch, uh, you put on a mask to, to measure the amount of oxygen they're burning and carbon dioxide they're, they're exhaling. Um, and then you compare that to when the person is on a treadmill doing exactly the same thing with the mask. And you ask, what's the change? Well, what you see is the change is actually very little uh, because most of the energy that we burn is, uh, it's referred to as our basal metabolic rate, uh, is concerned with keeping you alive. You've got, I've, I've forgotten the number, two trillion cells in your body, something of, of that order. They all need oxygen. They all need energy. They all need uh, to repair themselves. They all need waste products carried away. And they need to do this on a continual basis. So they're engaged in this continual traffic that you're not aware of uh, unless you hold your breath and then you realize suddenly how badly you need oxygen. Um, and that accounts for most of, the, of your energy burn. So trying to get people to lose weight um, uh, by uh, cutting down on their food simply slows their metabolism. Your body is designed to fight against weight loss because we evolved in a climate when we were you know, uh, making that great journey out of Africa where food sources were very limited. Uh, you might eat today, you might not eat tomorrow. Um, so what you wanna do is when you get food, you wanna store the energy so you have it. And what we've done is we've created an environment where food is everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, I can go down to my local shop and I can get pizza, I can get sushi, I can get food from all over the world without any trouble. Um, and uh, we, we've created this food rich environment. Um, but the problem is this food rich environment is addressing a problem that we humans don't have. Um, which is to, if you don't currently have, which is that we generally are not worried about restricted access to food. In fact, what we have is excess access to food. So if people want to lose weight, um, exercise more uh, is not going to do much for you. It'll, it might help a little at the margins. What people really need to focus on is what they're eating. Um, and uh, I, 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 I talk in the book about the Western diet versus uh, other styles of diet. Uh, and we know, for example, that uh, when people move from Japan, where they've got very, uh, they're, they're not obese, uh, they've got very good blood cholesterol and all, all the rest of it, and they move to the US or they move to Europe, their, their metabolic status disimproves very quickly because of the food environment. What we really need to do is, is to change what we're eating. We need to be eating food that's metabolically expensive to digest. So think about, for example, uh, trying to digest rough porridge oatlets in the morning um, with a little bit of milk and a tiny bit of sugar or a tiny little bit of honey to make them a little more palatable versus a couple of donuts. Uh, you eat the donuts, they're in your bloodstream <laughs> a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> Whereas the, the low glycemic index porridge would be sitting in your gut, making you feel full for hours. Um, and you won't have that sugar crash two hours after you've eaten a bunch of donuts. It's, it's those kinds of shifts in our diet that we really need to make if, if uh, we want to get people to lose weight. And of course, we now have this new amazing, uh, I think for want for a better word, uh, the GLP-1 uh, antagonists Ozempec and Wegovy, uh, which uh, actually work uh, on these glucagon receptors. They, they they damp down the feeling of reward from eating. 
Um, so you, you don't have that same metabolic drive uh, to get uh, calories that you would have had otherwise. So I think that, you know, the, the, the way forward here is, is actually one of not giving out to people about why they're eating so much. The food environment around us, the ecology that we live in, is designed to make us do that. And our evolutionary drive is one to say, look, we might be hungry tomorrow, uh, but we've got food today. The problem is we've solved that problem, so we need a different approach. Yeah, we need a, definitely need a different approach. And walking can be a part of that approach. And as you mentioned, Absolutely. You know, be, because a, a part of that is also this feeling of there are times where we might have, uh, you know, depending on people's diets and generally my audience here, you know, they all consider themselves to be in sort of uh, some category of more mindful eating, clean eating. Uh, that might mean that there's certain foods that they stay away from on a regular basis. But every so often, we all eat different things. And one of the simplest uh, things that we can do is after eating a big meal, especially if it contains more processed food inside of that meal, is go for a, a walk afterwards. Can you chat about that? Yes. Yeah, so there's actually two things you can do before you eat the big meal. Go for a walk beforehand. It actually has the paradoxical effect of blunting your appetite. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Which people aren't very terribly well aware of. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. Going for a walk afterwards has one very good effect, uh, which is that it stops the spike in blood sugar uh, that you would otherwise have. Um, the, uh, uh, when you've eaten a huge meal, uh, typically uh, when you measure the, uh, the, the kind of postprandial uh, glucose and these other variables in your blood, what you'll see is a big spike in the blood sugar. And you have these receptors in the brain that are sensitive to the amount of sugar uh, that's in your blood and they make you feel sleepy. Um, but if you go for the walk, that feeling of need to sleep disappears and you're actually burning the excess off uh, in muscle and, and in other things through the activity. Um, but I, th I think if you can do both, go for a walk beforehand, you won't eat as much and go for a walk afterwards, uh, which is what we do under, you know, normal circumstances. If you're living out in the on the uh, in the steps or wherever uh, you you run to hunt to get your food, you, you catch your antelope or what, whatever it happens to be. You walk at home, uh, you uh, butcher it, you do whatever you do. And then you have to go for a walk afterwards because you're going to have to get food again. Um, whereas all I have to do is go to the fridge, <laughs> you know. So uh, we, 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 we've solved this problem. Um, and it's great that we have, you know, nobody should be going hungry in the modern world. But the, the consequence is that we have these other spillovers. Yeah. And we're trying to adapt our lifestyle accordingly and sort of inspire a different uh, organization of cities, which we're going to get to in a second, because you have a lot of thoughts on that inside of your book. Um, you know, I want to talk about the practicalities of do you genuinely feel for most people the idea and I'm asking in a genuine manner, uh, you know, I've heard the, the advice of people walking after meal and you've now added in the walking before. What are, what are some practical ways that people can start to think about incorporating that into their life, you know, in sort of this modern world that we live in? You know, what, what do you do or what do you recommend to people out there out there? Sorry to interrupt, but memory loss is on the rise. And that's why I've created a free guide that you can get right now featuring the top brain boosting foods that you can include into your diet starting today to help you combat this. I've worked with a few of my friends to feature five foods in this free guide. And guess what? A couple of them will probably surprise you. Make sure you're one of the people that focuses on keeping your brain sharp by downloading this guide today. Just click on the link below or scan the QR code and I'll send you the guide right away. I, th I think the first thing we have to do is not be condemnatory of individuals. Um, the, the world we live in is designed in a particular way. And the way you or I, or the, the effect that you or I can have on changing the design of that world is is relatively limited, um, you know. So if you're living in, a, in an environment as I happen to be where I live here, where we have good sidewalks, good lighting, good access to local parks and a short walk to the train station to take me to work, that's e it's a really easy for me. It's a no brainer. The car is a, really something I don't want to use, uh, especially as I said, Dublin is an old medieval city. You don't want to be driving into it. Um, but you know, if I was living, let's say in, in dark, deepest, darkest rural Ireland, um, where there are no footpaths, 
Um, th there's no street lighting. Um, th there's only dark, narrow roads. Walking at night for people under those circumstances is actually kind of dangerous. Um, you know, so we, we really do have this kind of issue that the infrastructure around you, for which you're principally not responsible, makes a huge difference. And, and you can see this, in, as, a, as I've said, in cities like New York, really easy to walk. The sidewalks are nice and big. Uh, everything is, is, is reasonably straightforward in terms of walking, and it's easier to get around than getting into a car. So that really is an issue. But I think, you know, thinking about what you can change as an individual is important as well. So if you have to use a car and you're driving to the shops, you know, you, I'm sure this happens in the US. It certainly happens here in Ireland. People drive as close to the door as they possibly can to the shop that they're going to. Uh, don't do that. Park a little bit away in the car park so you actually have to walk a bit. That, uh, you know, it adds 200 steps at each end. That's a little bit of a small gain. So I think what you have to be conscious of is figuring out how you can get little small incremental gains. If if you're walking to a cafe to get your lunch, don't go to your usual cafe. Go to one that's another few minutes away. So you add in an extra few steps. You explore maybe a little bit more of your town or, or, your, or your city. If you take the bus to work, you know, a very simple thing to do is, is just use a bus stop that's a little bit further away so that you get a little bit more of uh, a, a, a few more steps in. If you're in your office, um, have a, an alarm on your on your phone or on your laptop or whatever, or just a note. I have, I have a note <laughs> on a post-it saying, get up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, get up every 20 minutes or every half hour for a little walk around. Um, if you're about to change between one major project and another, don't go straight from one to the other. Get up and go for a walk. Move about. Do something different. Um, as I've said already, if you're taking a phone call uh, and people do still take phone calls, stand up, move, walk. If you take a half hour or 40 minute phone call, you'll crank out maybe 2,000, 3,000 steps without noticing. Um, so there's lots of little ways that you can incrementally add just a little bit more movement, excuse me, into your uh, your day, but it, you do have to be a little bit conscious of it. Um, but like I said, you know, this issue of how the infrastructure around us works is really important. The building I work in, um, if you want to come up to my office, it's up on the third floor. Uh, if you want to get to the, the, the lift, you just come in the door, you turn right, there's the lift or the elevator, as you call it in the US. If you want to take the stairs, you have to go through four fire doors. Uh, <laughs> now, you're welcome to do that, uh, but you're going to have, sorry, three fire doors. Uh, and then a fourth one to get out onto my uh, my uh, floor. Uh, and that's a building that, you know, when I, I look at it now, I think we did not build movement into that building. Mm. Uh, whereas, you know, architects, I think, are a bit more conscious these days of trying to ensure that there's more movement, that workspaces are built in an active way. You know, walking desks are a thing now. Um uh, uh, having walking meetings is a thing now. It wasn't uh, a thing previously. Having standing meetings, all these kinds of ways, uh, you know, go for a walk around your corridor if you can't walk outside. You, you can build extra little bits of movement in without trying too hard. Um, but you have to be conscious of it. Absolutely. And that's what we're doing on this podcast today. Well, rather you're doing through your work and I'm just getting a chance to sit here and try to ask good questions without mixing up studies. Um, <laughs> you know, you've mentioned that walking is not just walking. There's different types of walking. And the more aware we are of these different types of walking, the more that we can tap into them for their respective benefits. Can you give us some of the examples of the different types of walking and how somebody might utilize them to achieve, you know, the respective goal in that category? YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. To see typically is the average adult walks somewhere around about four and a half thousand, maybe 5,000 steps a day. Whereas the tribal societies I'm talking about on average around 14,000 steps a day. 